Thank you very much for reading. Please keep that open in front of you. And perhaps you could also turn to the inside of the song sheet and you'll find on the back of the notices an outline with a little diagram. And I hope that will help you in a moment. Um, I want to make a, a book recommendation of my own. Um, and it's a book about Hosea and about the whole theme of Hosea throughout the whole of the Bible. Um, but it's got one of those titles that meant it had to be reissued with another title. There's a few Christian books like that where they didn't get the title quite right the first time around. It's a kind of test of when, when you bought it as to whether you get the original title or the new title. For example, there's a brilliant book about guidance that was originally called The Last Word on Guidance, uh, which is a slightly kind of uh, arrogant title. Uh, the book was meaning that God's word is the last word on guidance, but people misunderstood it and thought that they were making a claim about their own writing. And so it got reissued with the, the title Guidance and the Voice of God. Great book. Here's another book. Uh, here's the original title, Whoredom. Um, there's the original title. Um, it's now reissued and it's called God's Unfaithful Wife, um, which is, is marginally less offensive. I, I don't know whether they, they had to change it because no one would buy this on, on the bookshelf. Imagine taking it to the cashier. I guess you'd do it by Amazon anonymously, wouldn't you? But imagine um, putting that in your, sh in your shopping trolley or it, it, it arriving and you opening it. Um, it it's a, a shocking title for a book, but it's a kind of appropriate title for a book about Hosea. Because Hosea is a book about whoredom, a book about prostitution, uh, a book about being in bed with another god. It's an ugly book, it's full of ugly images, it's full of painful um, ideas, um, it's not very much fun to, to read. Um, just if you haven't been here over the last three weeks, I'd really recommend you went, go onto the website to download Charlie's um, three um, sermons, four sermons rather, which, um, which in some ways set the real foundation for the book of Hosea, chapters 1 to 3, where Hosea the prophet has to act out in his own marriage to Goma something of what the Lord has to go through with Israel, uh, the nation of God. He has to marry a woman who's notoriously um, unfaithful. Um, he has children by her who he gives horrible names. I won't have mercy on you, is one of their names. Um, you're not my people, is another one of their names. Um, and then he has to go through the whole experience of watching her uh, cavolt with different lovers and sleep with other men. And then he has to have her back. And that is a picture in history of what it's like for God to be in relationship with a people who are unfaithful to him. It's been a powerful book. I really commend those first three chapters to you and those first sermons on the website on them. But now, in, in chapters 4 to 10, we begin to look in some detail as to the nature of their ad adultery. We get to see what their whoredom is really like. And it's pretty unpleasant, and it's full of horrible images, and there's not very much good news, I have to warn you. But before we dive in, I wanted us to spend a little bit of time just thinking about the question of how this applies to the Christian. How do we get from Hosea to us today? And you can't just do with the Bible the this is to me approach. Now you pray for God to speak to you, you flick to a random page and it happens to be Hosea and it says go and, and marry a prostitute, Hosea 1 verse 2. And it would be inadvisable to take that as God's word directly to you. The kind of all of the Bible's directly to me approach to reading the Bible gets us into all kinds of trouble. It's not that the Bible isn't relevant. It's not that it's not God's living word. It's not that God int doesn't intend to speak to us through it. But we can't always go directly. Uh, and we need to think a little bit carefully about when this was written and to whom it is written. And in neither case does it apply directly to us. It was written to Israel, to a nation of, of Abraham's descent, to Jewish people. And many of us here are not Jewish. In fact, it was written to the, the northern kingdom of, of Samaria, and uh, even those here who are Jewish may well not be Samaritan Jewish. So that narrows it down kind of ethnically. It was also written um, many thousand years ago to a people at a different stage in Bible history to us. And we cannot simply read from Hosea and apply it directly to us. You shouldn't marry a prostitute, and I don't think there's anything wrong with eating Eccles cakes. I don't know if you noticed that reference last, last week. Um, chapter 3, verse 2. Um, oh, sorry, chapter 3, verse uh, 1. 
where the people who are adulterous, they go to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Well, I bought some Eccles cakes just yesterday, and I think that's okay, notwithstanding Hosea. So um, in order to, to apply it, we just need to think a bit carefully. I wanted to do this as a kind of test case to revise some of what Charlie's told us and to sketch it out in a little diagram, because we'll need this kind of thinking whenever we read an Old Testament book written to different people at a different time and want to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to us now through it. Uh, and in particular, you'll see that I, I've drawn it on a Bible timeline where lots of stuff's happened between Hosea on the left and us on the right. Hosea is prophesying to the, the nation of Israel who are guilty of, of unfaithfulness to God and about to go into exile to Assyria. Um, that exile is pictured like a divorce. God is going to break his relationship with his unfaithful people and send them into exile to be punished for their sin. And so I've written there the divorce of Israel happens in 722 BC as they go off into exile to, to Syria. A little bit later, Judah, which is the southern kingdom, the southern part of the original nation of Israel, they also go into exile because of their unfaithfulness. Uh, this time under the Babylonians. And they're carted off, and for, for many, many years, uh, they live without a temple, without priests, without prophets, and without the Lord. But Hosea has been prophesying not only this terrible divorce to come, this terrible exile to come, but also a restoration, a return from exile, a second chance at a relationship. Because the extraordinary message of Hosea is that even though God's people have been so unfaithful to him, even though he's caught them in bed with somebody else, and he's deeply, deeply angry and hurt by that, nonetheless, he'll have them back. And we've seen already in Hosea, in the first three chapters, um, several prom promises of restoration and forgiveness and another chance. Uh, and that remarriage, I've shown in our diagram, actually happens through the cross of Jesus. It's the cross of Jesus where those who were once far from God because of the broken relationship with him are given a second chance to be God's people, are forgiven and become, again, people married to God. And we come after that in Bible history, after the remarriage, after the greatest act of forgiveness and a second chance um, as Jesus died on the cross. So what difference does it make to read Hosea as people who exist on the right of the diagram? Well, I've put two points there on the handout. Firstly, whoredom is something we have been saved from. Whoredom is something we've been saved from. Now, we don't read this as something that's about to happen to us. We don't read this primarily as a warning of what is um, to come. You know, God is about to send you off into exile. We read this as people who've come back from exile. We read this as people who've experienced God's mercy and the second chance and the remarriage. Hordom is something we've been saved from. And you remember Charlie took us to those verses in 1 Peter where Peter quotes from Hosea, but he quotes from the good news bit of the prophecy. That you've got a chance to come back, part of the prophecy. Hosea's kids get terrible names, you're not my people, and I won't have mercy on you. But then later, his kids' names get changed. Not mercy gets called mercy. Not my people gets called my people. And that is the bit of, of Hosea that Peter quotes from to apply to the Christian, Jew, Samaritan, Gentile, whoever you might be. Um, Peter says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In other words, whoredom is something we've been saved from. We can look at Hosea and say, that is where God's people were in history before Jesus came along. Or we can read it as maybe Gentile Christians and say, well, that is the, the kind of equivalent mess that I would have been in before Jesus saved me. So we don't read this primarily and get depressed. This is a description of our current whoredom. We read this and feel relieved and feel thankful. This is a situation from which Jesus 
saved me. And it's no accident we had that as our, as our verse for the whole of the service. We, we plan the services to, to fit around the sermon. And so all service we've been singing about the way in which Jesus has rescued us from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers and has brought us back to know God. Hall is something we've been saved from. I, I used the analogy in Romans before of the, the difference it makes when you look at a tumour, some kind of cancerous tumour, to see it on the x-ray as something that's inside you and to see it pickled in the formaldehyde jar as something that was surgically removed from you. That is a different experience. Both times it's pretty disgusting, this tumour. But to see on the x-ray, it's a description of how you are now and it's very serious. This is going to have terrible consequences for you. But to see it in the formaldehyde jar safely removed, well, it's cause for thanks to the surgeon and relief. Well, Hosea, what well, applies to us, says, well, we come in after it's all been sorted out, and we say praise to Jesus. And yet, yet hoarding is something that we ought not to go back to. Um, and um, I've been thinking a bit about, Charlie showed us in, in some ways that you know, Hosea's warnings do apply very much to our own temptations to leave Jesus behind. And we were looking through the Bible to see if, if the Bible anywhere gives us this explicit clue on, on how to, to, to apply Hosea. And I think there's a couple of places, and Charlie found the first one, I found the second one, that, that helped to, to, to reinforce that. The first one's in 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul speaks about God's people as, as those betrothed to Jesus that he hopes to give to Jesus as a virgin. Our wedding day to Jesus is in the future. Um, we're already engaged. Uh, and Paul is very anxious that we make it to our wedding day with our virginity intact. Uh, and in the context, he is warning the Corinthians that, that if they go after this false teaching which besets their church, it will be like ad- idolatry, it will be like adultery. It will be like losing their virginity. It will be like going back to the terrible situation of of Hosea from which they were saved. Very similar idea in James. James says, do you not realise that friendship towards the the world is hatred towards God? You adulterous people. Don't get in bed with the world again. Jesus has saved you from the world. Don't go back to it. So as we read Hosea, uh, we read it with a sense of relief. Thank goodness I was not born in that time in Bible history when there hadn't yet been the birth of a saviour. When people were in a terrible mess. Thank goodness, praise God, that Jesus came and that I live afterwards and I've been saved from this. But at the same time, that line of application that Charlie took us down last time, let's be careful lest we go back. Lest we turn to our pre-saved condition of adultery. And whether it be friendship with the world or whether it be some kind of false teaching, that will cause us to lose our virginity. Well, how does it apply to the Christian? Something we've been safe from, something we ought not to go back to. Well, I'm sorry for taking so long on that first point, but I want us to, to use that framework as we go on. And we're going to turn back to these verses in Hosea. And uh, we have today six chapters worth. It's too much for a sermon. Um, Hopefully you'll be reading it yourself. Uh, It doesn't read as a single um, logical argument. And I think that's because it's a very emotional book. It's a a pouring out of hurt and indignation. How God feels about them in their unfaithfulness comes out of his mouth repetitively, going over the same ground with, with image upon image, and it's all a bit of a jumble, a bit of a mess. Because they're in their hoard and they are in a real mess. I want to pull out two themes, hopefully as a handle for you as you go and read back through it over this week. Firstly, Israel was in bed with false religion. Israel was in bed with false religion. We've been saved from this. We ought not to go back to this. Now look at chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. And you'll see that that the things they were in bed with were quite literally other gods. Uh, Not real gods, but but man-made gods. Verse 12, chapter 4, verse 12. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, 
They've left their God to play the whore. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains and burn offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters play the whore and your brides commit adultery. Um, a whoredom is for them quite simply going off to other gods. Um, gods that they make out of wood, out of their walking stick even. I mean, it's meant to be a ridiculous image. Imagine, you know, take out your walking stick and start talking to it. Um, what advice would you give me, walking stick? And then bowing down to it and sacrificing to it. And oh, It's a ridiculous thing. He's deliberately mocking them, but they are bowing down to all kinds of little statues instead of bowing down to the, the true God. It's idolatry. It's false religion. You get the same image over a couple of chapters in um, chapter 8, um, verses 4 to 6. Chapter 8, verse 4. They made kings, but not through me. They set up princes. I didn't know it. With their silver and their gold, they make idols for their own destruction. I have spurned your calf, O Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be in, incapable of innocence? For it is from Israel. A craftsman made it. It's not God. The calf of Samaria shall be broken to pieces. Here's a, a flashback to, to idolatry earlier in their history, when they'd just been rescued out of Egypt, and instead of praising the, the one God who'd saved them, they instead handed in their earrings made of gold. The Blakes had earrings as well in those days, and they handed lots of gold, and Aaron melted it down and made it into a golden calf. And they worshipped the golden calf. And God was very, very angry because of their unfaithfulness, and there was great disaster. But then they do it again later in, uh, in Israel's history, at Dan and, and, and Beersheba. They, they make more golden calves to, to bow down before. And God is angry. And God says here, can you not see how stupid this is? It, a craftsman made it. It's not God. It's something you buy at the local craft fair is not something to be worshipped, something to decorate your house perhaps not something to bow down before. And then chapter 9, verse 10, um, another image from the Old Testament, from their history. Chapter 9, Like grapes in the wilderness, I found Israel. Like the first fruit on the fig tree in its seasons, I saw your fathers, but they came to Baal Peor, consecrated themselves to a thing of shame, and became detestable, like the thing they loved. So all the way through Hosea, he's saying that their adultery is quite literally for them, going and bowing down to things that aren't good, as if they were. But two things come kind of related to that, in a kind of triangle of whoredom. There's the false worship, but it goes hand in hand with immorality. See, false gods don't have the same standards that the true god has. It's part of their attraction, I guess. And so as they're caught up with worship of things that aren't good, they're caught up in a lifestyle that doesn't honour God. Look, look, turn back to chapter 4. We'll spend a little bit more time in chapter 4. Let's carry on reading. We, we read verse 12 and, and 13. They sacrificed on the tops of the mountains, burnt offerings on the hills. Let, let's look on at verse 14. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes. And a people without understanding shall come to ruin. In other words, I'm not going to join you in being indignant and dismayed about the teenage pregnancy rate in your country. I'm not going to join with you and be dismayed at the, the juvenile delinquency. I'm not going to be dismayed at the, the sex trade in your country. Why? Why will I not punish your daughters when they play the whore? Because actually, and this really exposes the kind of sexist bigotry of the whole thing, Actually, men, because it's your fault. Dads, it's your fault. Because at the same time as your daughters are getting pregnant at any age, you dads are going to the temple and sleeping with the cult prostitutes. What do you expect? You see, if your religion has become so corrupted that you follow false gods and therefore live a false way, what do you expect? That there should be that kind of breakdown in sexual ethics? And the kind of horrific things, even within your own families. See, false worship, false gods have different standards. And so um, adultery comprises both false worship and false lifestyle. The two so often go together. As you know, for instance, even the Church of England at the moment, that those churches that have the, 
the most different sexual ethics from the Bible are often also those churches that care most about extraordinary practices of ritualistic worship. It just often seems to go together. Once you redefine worship and, and, and the true and living God is not at the heart of it, so you redefine lifestyle and ethics begin to slide. Uh, you see that as you, as you read on through these chapters again and again, their behaviour is corrupt. Um, things are going downhill in their society because their worship is corrupt. That's two sides of the triangle, idolatry and immorality. But the third point of the triangle is ignorance. And I think this is what gets the whole thing started. How does a people that were saved to know God turn to worship walking sticks? I mean, it's a ridiculous thing. How does that happen? We'll look back at chapter 4 and we'll see why it is. Chapter 4, verse 4. Let no one contend, let no one accuse, for it's with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet shall stumble by night. I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. Since you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. See, it all begins with the priests failing to teach the people the words of God. And therefore, there's ignorance of God. And where there's ignorance of God, there's superstition. And where there's superstition, there's immorality. And where there's immorality, society begins to degenerate. Once the Bible is taken out of the temple, once the priests no longer teach people the truth, everything begins to slide. Superstition... Immorality, breakdown of society. And God calls it whoredom. They were in bed with false religion. Well, um, this is something that we have been saved from. If you come to know the Lord Jesus, you have been saved from praying to your walking stick, I hope. I hope no one is doing that at home. You've been saved from false ideas of worship, You've been saved from immorality. Maybe there's people here who've been involved in all kinds of lifestyles that went with their old belief systems. I was just doing a couple of university missions recently, and it's a really good experience for me just spending the whole week with people who do not believe anything about God. But just seeing the connection between completely um, wrong ideas about God and completely wrong ideas about human life and value. So I I remember talking to someone, very sadly, he he honestly couldn't give me any reason why her life had any value to it. Because she believed that we're just atoms that arrived randomly. And if all we are is is atoms, and then eventually we decompose for eternity and get recycled in carbon dioxide, then, then what's the point of anything? And so her lifestyle was one of despair and cheap, um, a cheapened view of herself. Maybe there's people here who similarly had false ideas about God, um, ignorance that led to superstition, that led to all kinds of shameful ways of treating your, your body, that led to the degradation of yourself and those around you uh, in your pagan society. But these are days of Israel's history that the Christian can look back on. This is before Jesus came to save us. And we can look back as at the tumour, safely removed, now in the formaldehyde jar, and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me from that. Yet at the same time, it would be as well to be on our guard that we didn't drift back to that. What an irony it would be to, to have been saved, to worship the one true God, to have been redeemed from the, the empty way of life handed down from our forefathers and yet to continue to live as the pagans do in the futility of their thinking, to drift backwards into idolatry. Um, Well, um, that could happen in various ways. I I guess it would start with stopping hearing the words of the Lord. Going to a church where the priests don't, well, the, the ministers in this case, don't know the law of the Lord, don't teach the ways of the Lord. And so gradually superstition takes over, Uh, Ritual replaces the love of God. 
uh, and immorality replaces the ethics of the Bible. I reckon it would start with just that, that refusing to hear the Bible and that going to a church that doesn't place the Bible central. I remember uh, meeting a, a friend of mine who I used to, to pray with at college years later. I mean, we having a conversation. I kind of assumed that we were still on the same page. And he said something that just didn't quite make sense. I thought he never would have said that years ago. And he said, well, you see, Andrew, I, I no longer believe quite the same things that we used to believe together when we were in the Christian Union. I thought, how could this have happened to him? Well, it turns out he went to a different church where the, the vicar had a different kind of view of the Bible. He didn't believe it was God's word. didn't believe we always had to submit to it. began to teach different things about ethics. began to teach different things about religion. And slowly he drifted. Don't go back to the ignorance, to the idolatry, to the immorality that you were saved from. Well, there's lots of images to look at yourself in Hosea that show you just how ugly that can be. But I want to just draw out one other big theme that comes through the Bible, and that is um, that Israel is in bed with false religion, and things begin to go very wrong for them. But then when things begin to go wrong, and when they can see that things are going wrong, Israel turns to false saviours. And that is the other aspect of their unfaithfulness. They're unfaithful in their worship and in their lifestyle. But when they begin to suffer the consequences, well, then they begin to go to other gods to save them. And they're guilty of adultery and whoredom in that respect as well. You, you see the theme begins in chapter 5, verse 13. Chapter 5, verse 13. This is our first hint of this theme. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to the great king. But he is not able to cure you or heal your wound, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim. Here's the great irony. When things begin to go wrong for them, when they begin to see God's displeasure, they go for help, well actually to the nation that's about to wipe them off the map the nation that's about to carry them off into exile. They go to Assyria. Assyria is not able, Assyria is not able to cure you. Assyria is not able to heal your wound. But off they go. Uh, then the theme comes back in chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 11. Ephraim is like a dove silly and without sense, calling to Egypt, going to Assyria. As they go, I'll spread my net over them. I'll bring them down like the birds of the heavens. I'll discipline them according to the report made to the congregation. Woe to them, for they have strayed from me. Here's a picture of a bird. It's not a very flattering picture. Um, I'm not that fond of doves either. I was always woken up by them as a kid because my next door neighbour installed a dove cot on the top of their roof right next to my bedroom window. Thanks. Um, well, here's a not very flattering picture of a dove. He obviously doesn't think highly of this particular bird. It is a stupid bird, going this way and that, cuckooing to anyone. Here is a dove going off to Egypt, going off to Assyria. How stupid, how ironic, because Egypt was the country from which God rescued them. Assyria is the country where they're about to go into exile. And yet that is the place that they turn for help. And then the theme comes back for the final time in chapter 8, verse 7. Here's one of the most famous phrases that's made its way into popular literature that originates in Hosea. Chapter 8, verse 7, They sow the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. The standing corn has no heads, it shall yield no flower. If it too were to yield, strangers would devour it. Israel is swallowed up. Already they are among the nations a useless vessel. For they have gone up to Assyria, a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has hired lovers. Though they hire allies among the nations, I'll soon gather them up. The kings and the princes shall soon writhe because of the tribute. When things begin to go wrong because of their sin, instead of turning back to God, they turn to, ironically, ironically they turn to the very things that will hurt them most. The narration of Assyria the nation of Egypt, from which once they were slaves. And that is the stupidity of, adult, of idolatry, isn't it? That's the foolishness 
of idolatry because it does begin to, to hurt you. Um, any kind of false ultimate God causes enormous damage to you. Take, for example, an obvious example, take alcohol addiction. And alcohol becomes the place you turn to for comfort in a particular situation. And you become enslaved to it, and it starts to mess up your life. It really does. Alcoholism can wreck people's lives. But the irony is that the alcoholic who's been kind of rescued from, from that is in most danger of going back under periods of distress or duress caused by, perhaps, the alcohol. You've been saved from it. It's the thing that hurt you most of all, but it's the place you go to for comfort when you're in trouble from it. Same is true of drug addiction. Um, the, the low that the, the heroin caused is the low that you seek to, to satisfy by going back to the heroin. It's true often of, of, of um, sexual deviancy. The, the mess that you're in because of your uh, sexual behavior um, often produces the kind of situation where you're desperate for escape, which you go to that sexual behavior to escape from. Uh, well, that was true of them. They, they're, they're, their um, adultery got them in the mess. But as they begin to suffer from it, they go back to their lovers to escape from the mess. And so it becomes a vicious cycle. Assyria cannot heal you. Assyria is not able to bind up your wounds. And yet this is something that we have been saved from. Yes, in a culture with a, a history of people turning to all kinds of things to rescue them from the mess of their lives are in. Addiction to career, addiction to alcohol, addiction to sex, other religions, other mythologies. But we have been saved from that. We know the one true saviour who is able to heal us and is able to bind up our, our wounds. Praise God, we know the one who in history rescued Israel out of exile and who included us as the Gentiles, as people on whom God had had mercy. And yet, nonetheless, in those periods of trial, well, then comes the test of whether we'll rely still on the only saviour that we'll have. Sometimes when suffering comes, uh, when stress comes, uh, when pressure begins to build, that can be the time that we're most tempted to turn to something else to help us. Um, and those are the times that we need to remember that only Jesus rescued Israel in history. Only Jesus rescued us if we're Christians. And we must turn nowhere else but him for healing. So how does this pretty grim um, chapter apply to the Christian? Something we've been saved from. Praise God for the surgery completed, the tumour in the jar of formaldehyde. But don't go back to it. Don't go back to adultery with the world. Don't go back to adultery with false teaching. Keep your spiritual virginity intact until the day that we meet Jesus on the great wedding banquet of the Lamb. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can read um, horrible chapters of the Bible um, from the standpoint of those who have experienced a wonderful salvation. And we praise you, Lord, as we've been thinking about all service, that we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers with the precious blood of Christ. Help us, Father, to um, thank you, to praise you for the adultery, the idolatry, the ignorance, the immorality that Jesus has saved us from. And keep us from going back to it, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.